When it comes to Jane and John Doe's, there is often so much we don't know. Depending on their state of decomposition when found, their age, race, height, weight, hair and eye colour can often vary from an exact determination to unknown. However, one factor that is rarely in question is the victim's gender, and when the police found a body in a Florida swamp in 1988, they correctly determined the body was that of a female. However, it wouldn't be until decades later that they would discover her original biology, which added another layer to her case and possibly a motive to her murder. Let's uncover the case of Julie Doe. Hello and welcome to the 8th episode of Uncover True Crime Podcast. My name is Stephanie and each week we uncover a different unsolved true crime case ranging from missing persons, unsolved murders, Jane and John Doe's and suspicious deaths. You can listen to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher and other podcast streaming apps as well as on YouTube. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at uncover underscore pod or on Instagram at uncover true crime pod. Before we get started on today's case, I just wanted to say that I hope you are all physically and mentally coping with the current coronavirus epidemic. Even if you are physically unaffected, all the changes going on right now can be quite hard to deal with mentally. So I just want to encourage everybody to really focus on your mental health through these trying times. I'm going to try to keep the podcast going business as usual. However, as I am a key worker and I am currently homeschooling my son due to the lockdown, there may be delays in the production of the podcast. Although if there is any, I will update you all on my Instagram and on my Twitter. Again, I hope you are all doing really well. There is light at the end of the tunnel and together... We can get through this. Without any further ado, let's uncover the case of Julie Doe. On the 25th of September 1988, mummified remains of an adult female were found in a wooded area of Green Swamp, Florida. Police referred to her as Julie Doe, however from this point on I will refer to her simply as Julie. She was thought to have been dead for approximately 8 months meaning that she likely died around January of 1988. Due to the condition of her body, a cause of death has never been established, but police are investigating her death as a homicide, as there were signs that her body had been dragged from the edge of the road to where she was eventually found. I would like to note here that 8 months seems like a very long time for drag marks to still be visible on muddy and grassy terrain. From viewing the area on Google Maps, it doesn't seem like somewhere you would have a lot of foot traffic and perhaps the killer or killers were familiar enough with the area that they would know that. There are several bodies of water and a massive wildlife preserve nearby, so I think it's interesting they chose to dump her body here. Julie was likely sexually assaulted as it appears as though someone had tried to take off her skirt and underwear. The investigation into her death commenced However, there was very little information for investigators to go off of back then. The autopsy, conducted by Dr. William Maples, determined that Julie was a white female aged between 22 to 35 years old. She was 5 foot 10, weighed 170 pounds, and her build was described as being athletic and, quote, robust, unquote. She had bleach blonde hair, but her natural hair colour was brown and her eye colour is unknown. She was wearing a greeny blue tank top with a manisha long acid wash skirt and sported long manicured nails. Julie had previously suffered from a fractured right cheekbone which would have been the result of blunt force trauma and a broken nose. Her fifth rib on her left side had previously been fractured but had since healed and there was also a previous fracture on the fifth toe on her right foot. Dr. Maple also concluded that she had some kind of hormonal imbalance and had given birth at least once during her life. It appears as though her case sat dormant and all detective Tamara Dale was assigned to it in 2010. She ordered further forensic testing on Julie's remains and this is when it was discovered that she had an XY genotype, meaning that she had been born male and was transgender. 
something that hadn't been documented in the first autopsy. Back in the 1980s, gender dysphoria was not as heard of or widely accepted as it is today. Her name as profile states that she was, quote, either in the process of or had undergone gender reassignment, unquote. However, she had undergone bottom surgery and a breast augmentation, and that alone seems to suggest that she had fully transitioned. She had also had a nose job and had been on hormone replacement therapy for a long time prior to her death, which accounts for why, in the original autopsy, Dr. Maples documented a hormone imbalance. The shape and size of her pelvis that had previously been attributed to her giving birth was likely also the result of hormone treatment. This new information could go a long way into identifying her, as gender reassignment treatment was performed much differently in the 1980s than it is today. The breast augmentation surgery she received must have been performed prior to 1983, as the method that the surgeon used was discontinued around that time. From my research, I believe this method was gel-filled silicon implants, however I am by no means an expert and that was just a guess based on the information I was able to find online. Her implants were said to be proportionate to her frame and would not have stood out or been particularly noticeable. There was no serial numbers linked to the implants, so police were unable to trace her that way, but at least we know that she started transitioning at least five years prior to her death, when she was likely between 17 to 30 years old. It is believed that this surgery took place in either Miami, New Orleans, California, New York or Atlanta, and isotope testing results indicate that she may have been native to southern Florida, and if this is correct, in my opinion it's slightly more likely that she would have had the surgery in either Miami or Atlanta. She had also had a nose job at some point in her life, and although this might have been to make her face look more feminine, it also could have been corrective surgery from when she had previously fractured her nose. She had undergone gender reassignment, which was uncommon in the 1980s. What confused me was that they were able to narrow down where she'd had her breast augmentation, but not her gender reassignment surgery. I wonder if the above list perhaps refers to the latter as opposed to breast surgery, as breast surgery would have been way more common, and I imagine that procedure would have been available in a wide range of places throughout the United States in the 1980s. Another thing that caught my attention when researching this case was that none of these three surgeries would have been cheap. I don't live in America, so I have absolutely no idea how the health system slash insurance system works, but from what I was able to gather, gender reassignment isn't covered by many insurance companies now, and I doubt that many, if any, would have covered it in the 1970s or 1980s. The nose job may have been covered if it was corrective surgery due to her having fractured her nose, but I'd imagine that back then, maybe now and again, I'm not sure, any surgery she required in order to appear more womanly would have been classed as cosmetic and thereby not covered under most policies. She paid for these surgeries somehow, it wouldn't have been cheap. Did she come from a middle class family, willing to support her financially during this process, or did she earn enough to pay herself? There is no real way to say at this point, but I think it's worth bearing in mind. If she had a job or support of friends and family who helped her financially and emotionally during this process, it's possible these people are still looking for her now. All the more reason to share her story and hope that someone will recognise her and call authorities. However, it is possible she didn't have support from loved ones during her transition, as even now, many transgender people are disowned after coming out, and this would have happened way more in the 1970s and 80s. If this is the case, they possibly won't recognise her digital recomposite, which obviously would make it much harder for anyone in her life to identify her now. Another thing I wanted to bring up is that given she was able to fund these surgeries somehow, it's likely that she probably wasn't homeless or transient. Even eight months after her death, investigators were still able to tell she had long manicured nails, which is not something you tend to see in people who are transient or homeless. I saw a lot of people on Reddit speculating that she isn't transgender at all, but instead suffers from a rare genetic condition called androgen insensitivity syndrome, or AIS for short. AIS affects biologically born males and is inherited through their mother's DNA. According to the NHS website, having AIS 
means that your body can't respond to testosterone properly, and while being biologically male, their genitalia may appear to be totally female, known as complete IAS, or somewhere between male and female, known as partial AIS. Sometimes this is diagnosed at birth or shortly thereafter, but it is sometimes not picked up until the child hits puberty. A blood test can often diagnose IAS, but if they have complete IAS and appear in every other way to be female, an ultrasound is performed to see if they have ovaries and a uterus. A lot of psychological support is needed for both the person suffering from the condition as well as their parents. Most people with complete IAS are raised as female, and those with partial IAS, it is more common for the child to stay as the gender that they were raised as. However, gender dysmorphia is very common in people with this condition, and some will transition to the opposite sex. People with AIS often receive surgeries in order for them to appear more like male or female, depending on the patient. Either is possible with Julie Doe, but it is more commonly thought that she is transgender, and I am inclined to agree although I thought it was important to include this as a possibility. The DNA Joe project have taken on her case, and while they have had great success in identifying Jane and John Doe's, Julie's case is proving to be slightly more difficult. The first two attempts to extract Julie's DNA were unsuccessful, although from what I was able to gather, the third try seems to have worked, so hopefully they'll be able to give her her name back soon. The Trans Doe Task Force was set up in order to identify other trans victims, and they recognise the specific challenges there are in finding their true identity and the hate violence that might have resulted in their deaths. The Trans Doe Task Force are currently researching 38 cases and through their hard work alongside the DNA Doe project have managed to identify the pillar point Jane Doe, another trans female. If you're interested in learning more about the Trans Doe Task Force or the DNA Doe project, the sources I used from both websites will be listed in my sources and the Trans Doe Task Force also have their own podcast and I would highly recommend checking that out. In the photos on the blog and on YouTube, I've included photos of what Julie may have looked like pre-transition. This is to aid in her identification and is not meant to cause offence or to be disrespectful to her gender. I hope that one day we will discover her name, and not just the one she was given at birth, but the name that she chose to represent her true identity as a female. I'm now going to share her vital statistics with you again. Julie was found on the 25th of September 1988 in Lake County, Florida. She had been dead for approximately 8 months. She was a white female, aged between 22 to 25 years old. She was around 5 foot 10 and weighed 180 pounds. Her natural hair colour was brown, although it had been bleached blonde. She had a robust and athletic build and she had a healed fracture on her left fifth rib, her right cheekbone, her fifth right toe and her nose. She'd also undergone a nose job and a breast augmentation. When Julie was found, she was wearing a green-blue tank top, Manisha long acid-washed denim skirt, and her nails were long and manicured. If you have any information on her case, or you recognise her photo or her description, please contact Tamara Dale at the Lake County Sheriff's Department on 352 343 9529. All sources and photos relating to this case, as well as every other case we cover on this podcast, can be found on our blog at uncoveredtruecrimepodcast.blogspot.com. If there are any updates on this case or any other case covered on the podcast, I will share them on my Twitter at uncover underscore pod or on my Instagram at Uncover True Crime Pod. That is everything I have for you this episode. Thank you for listening till the very end and have a good night.